The next prophetic event for each one of us, barring the coming in the clouds of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his coming to take us to heaven, if that doesn't occur, the next event for all of us is death. What is death? When our body wears out and this vehicle we've traveled in through life stops traveling and our spirit is released and we go into the presence of the Lord. But this morning I'd like to go back through to talk about the most horrible doctrine in the Bible, okay? The least desirable, the hardest to talk about, the worst of all teachings of God's Word. And that is the fact that God himself and, more importantly, God the Son, talks more about hell than he does about heaven. And I want to take this opportunity this morning to talk about what some theologians call that hideous doctrine of hell. This morning, I want to remind you of the reality of eternal hell for those, Jesus said, did not believe upon him. The amazing thing about hell is how seldom we ever hear about it. Because Jesus spoke more of hell than heaven. But we speak more of heaven than what? Hell. Yes. Jesus preached about the horrors awaiting the unsaved lost ones. He did it in public. He did it in private. He did it with saints. He did it with sinners. Jesus speaks much of it. We speak little, seldom of it. It was almost 20 years ago when I began an intense study through the Bible, every verse, as I read through the scriptures and looked for every occurrence of this doctrine of the eternal punishment of the lost. And as I was studying, I collected a lot of material. Let me just give you a summary. In fact, someone wrote over 20 years ago a summary of all of the verses. If you just synthesized them, blended them together, and put them in a flowing uh, passage, this is what it would sound like. And I want to share it with you this morning. That hideous doctrine of hell is fading. How often have you thought of it? in the past month. Does it make a difference in your concern for others as you witness? Is it a constant burden on your heart? The fate of those who reject Jesus Christ. Our Lord's word on the subject are unnerving. Jesus tells us of a rich man who died and went to Hades. That's the abode of the unsaved dead between death and the final judgment. That is the place where all who reject Jesus Christ from the time of Adam and Eve through the time of the end of this planet, all of them go to the same place called Hades. And from the story that Jesus recounts, the actual account, and from a few other passages... That, that could be linked together, we can infer what this place looks like. And that's what I'd like to do with you this morning. First, it's a place of great physical pain. The rich man's initial remarks conclude with his most pressing concern. Look at verse 24 of chapter 16. He says this, This is a living, immortal soul in the vestibule of the lake of fire. This is not hell proper. The Bible describes hell proper in the last book of the Bible. It's called Gehenna. Jesus talked about that too. This place is the waiting room for that. Before the final judgment, Hades is the abode of the dead. This man was there. What does he say in verse 24? I am in agony in this flame, he says. We don't make much of that. We should make much of that. We should let that sink in, what he said. We've all experienced pain to some degree. We can know it make a, makes a mockery of all our goals and desires. If you're in pain, you don't want to eat, you don't want to sleep, you don't want to do anything. You just, you just shut down when you're in intense pain. Yet we don't seem to know pain as a little hint of hell, a little foretaste of what will befall those who do not know Christ. Pain is a grim reminder every day of what through Christ alone we can be spared from. It's a great reminder. 
God does not leave us with simply the mute fact of hell's physical pain. He tells us how real people will respond to that pain. And our Lord wasn't being overly uh, grotesque as he said this. He is literally warning. And he's simply telling us the truth. In fact, if you want to go back to Luke 13 and verse 28, he, he repeats this concept in Luke 13 and verse 28. He says, first of all, there'll be weeping in verse 28 of Luke 13. Weeping. Think about that, that concept in hell. Weeping is not something we get a grip on. It's something that grips us when you hear someone weeping. Recall how you were affected the last time you heard someone weep. Remember how you were moved with compassion? You wanted to protect and restore that person? The Lord wants us to know and consider what an upsetting experience is for a person who's in hell. It says that they, verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 27 ends with, for those who never stop practicing iniquity. Weeping. Another response will be wailing. And we're going to get there momentarily in, in Matthew 13, it says at verse 42. While weeping attracts our sympathy, wailing frightens and offends us. It is the pitiable ball of a soul that's seeking escape, a person who's experienced hurt that's beyond repair. In hell, it's eternally unrepairable. So they wail. They weep because of their pain. They wail because of their hopelessness. It's amazing. Wailing is a sound grown, that has gone grotesque because we conclude we can't live with it, the pain anymore. A third response is right there in Luke 13, 28, that gnashing of the teeth. Why was Jesus telling us that? Perhaps because of the anger or frustration of the person. It may be a defense against crying out. It might be an intense pause when one is too weary to cry any longer. But Jesus says they will be gnashing, grinding their teeth together in this place, in between the weeping and the wailing. Hell has two other aspects we rarely consider. They're curious as well as frightening. On earth, we take for granted two physical properties that keep us physically, mentally, and emotionally stable. The first is light. Most of us don't really enjoy walking around in the dark. I mean, it's a fun game, you know, blind man's bluff, and it's, it's kind of fun for a moment, but darkness is not pleasant on the long haul. The other is a fixed surface. Most of us, it's, it's fun to go in a fun house where you're not sure and you feel like things are moving. But for most of life, we like a fixed surface, an unmoving ground or floor, and we like the lights on. Now think about how hell is described. Because oddly, these two dependables of life will not accommodate people in hell. There is the absence of light in the absence of a fixed surface. Hell is a place of darkness, Matthew 8, 12. Imagine the person who has just entered hell, be it your neighbor, your relative, your co-worker, or a friend. After the initial roar of physical pain passes by them and blasts them, they spend the first moments wailing and gnashing their teeth. But after a season, they grow accustomed to the pain. Not because it's more tolerable, but their capacity for experiencing it has enlarged and now they comprehend it. But they're not consumed by it. Though they hurt, they're now able to begin thinking. And instinctively they begin to look about them. But as they look, all they perceive is blackness all around them. Pain, thinking but blackness all around them. In our past life, we learned that if we look long enough, a glow of light would somewhere yield definition to our surroundings. So this individual blinks and strains to focus his eyes, but their efforts yield only more blackness. They turn, they strain, they look in another direction, they wait, but they see nothing but unyielding black ink. It's so dark it clings to them. It smothers them. It oppresses them. 
Realizing that the darkness is not going to give way, they nervously begin to feel around for something solid to get their bearing. They reach out for a wall, for a rock, for a tree, for a chair. They stretch their leg to feel the ground, and yet they touch nothing. The Bible says that hell is a bottomless pit, Revelation 20 tells us. However, the new occupant is slow to learn. In growing panic, they kick their feet, they wave their arms, they stretch, they lunge, but they find nothing. After more feverish tries, they pause from exhaustion. There they are, suspended in black, suddenly, screaming, kicking, twisting, lunging, again until they're too exhausted to move. Hanging there, alone, with pain, unable to touch a solid object or see a solitary thing, our friend begins to weep. They sob, they choke through the darkness, they become weak, and then those sobs are lost in just the roar around them of hell. As time passes, they begin to do what the rich man did. They again start to think. Their first thoughts are of hope. You see, this person still thinks as he did on earth when he kept himself alive with hope. When things got bad, he always found hope for a way out. When he felt pain, he took medicine, right? When we were hungry, we found food. When we lost love, there was more love to be found somewhere, somehow. That's how life on earth always is. So... He casts about in his mind for a plan to apply to the hope building in his chest. Of course, now he thinks of Jesus, the God of love. That's right. I remember now, Jesus can get me out of this. I heard about him somewhere, sometime. He cries with a surge, Jesus, Jesus, you are right after all. Now, please get me out of this. You are right. His words go off into the darkness so he thinks maybe he didn't cry enough and so he cries again after waiting and breathing hard with desperation and screams again Jesus I believe I believe now save me from this but the darkness just smothers his words And what's amazing is this sinner is not unique because all over Everyone in hell is now a believer. Everyone believes now. And when they weary of appeals, they do what exactly anyone would do. They assess their situation. They attempt to adapt to it. And then, finally, for this lost sinner, it hits him. The worst part, what the Bible repeats most often, That this blackness, this darkness, this bottomlessness, this vengeance of eternal fire lasts forever. Forever. If you believe that God exists forever, if you believe that Jesus died to give everlasting life, then the very same terminology of forever, of God, and of endless life for believers is the exact same term Jesus uses every time he talks about hell. And so our friend, as he thinks of forever, his mind begins to labor in the blackness until he aches. Forever, he whispers in wonder. The idea deepens, widens, and towers over him. The awful truth spreads before him like an endless, overlapping cloud forever. When I put 10,000 centuries of time here, I will not have accomplished one thing, he thinks. I will not have one second less to spend here. As we see in Luke 16, when the rich man pleaded for a drop of water, so too... This new occupant entertains a similar ambition. In life, he learned that even bad things could be tolerated if one could find the temporary relief. Perhaps even in hell, he thinks, if he could rest from one moment to the next, perhaps perhaps it would be more tolerable. He learns, though, as Revelation 14 tells us, 
that the smoke of his torment will go up forever and ever and that he will have no rest day or night. That's what the Bible says. Think about what that means, no rest day or night. Thoughts of this happening to people we know, people that are just like us, is too terrifying to entertain for very long. The idea of allowing someone to endure such torture for eternity violates the sensibilities of even the most severe judge among us. We as humans can't entertain that thought. But our thoughts of hell will never be so unmanageable as its reality. That's worse than our thoughts. We must take the doctrine of hell seriously and make sure we are practically affected by it. A hard look at hell should alter your estimation of sin. For hell is the byproduct of a life that is lived and ends in its sin. Jesus warned of dying with sin. In you and on you and me. 